the various trash, rough, coarse, inelegant. The Library Committee of Concord, Massachusetts, pronouncing judgment on Huckleberry Finn on its first appearance in 1885. The author is absolutely unconscious of almost all the canons of literary art. The Missouri Historical Review's opinion as late as 1920. All modern American literature comes from one book by Mark Twain called Huckleberry Finn. There was nothing before, there has been nothing as good since. The Judgment of Ernest Hemingway, Nobel Prize winning novelist. In this film lesson, Let's consider some of the elements in Huckleberry Finn that for us today make it a masterpiece. Let's approach it from two angles, its language and its form. What is the form, the pattern of the story? Well, if you read it quickly, it may seem like a series of disconnected episodes. Huck joins Tom's gang. Pat tries to kill Huck. Huck escapes from the cabin. Huck meets Jim. The Grangerfords welcome Huck. Buck is murdered, and so forth. Now, is the form really as loose as that? If so, would the book continue to exercise such a powerful spell on the imaginations of readers? There must be some elements that bind the book together, so that instead of a series of episodes, it becomes a unified work of art. Sometimes it won't talk without money, Huck. Well, all I got is a counterfeit quarter, and it ain't no good, because the brass shows through. Now, look you here. Mind how you talk to me. I've been in town two days. I ain't heard nothing but about you being rich. You get that money for me tomorrow. I want it. Well, I reckon your father's poor. Here, I'll put a $20 gold piece on this board. And you uh, get it when it floats by. 82, 83, 84, 85. $87.85. Now take it all around, Billswater. This year lays over any day I ever put in in the missionary line. Money seems to be a recurrent motif throughout the novel. And a recurrent motif helps to stitch a story together, much as the motif does in music. Another recurrent motif in Huckleberry Finn might be called reality versus appearance. Sometimes I think the novel should have been subtitled uh, Studies in Deception and Self-Deception. And that's the motif I'd like to examine with you for a few minutes. Let's start with Huck. Huck really begins his river adventures by turning into another person. They won't ever hunt the river for anything but my dead carcass. Huck's a corpse. There is no Huck. From now on, therefore, he's got to pretend to be someone else, for instance. What might your name be? Sarah Williams, ma'am. Again, several pages later, having been found out. What's your real name now? George Peters, ma'am. Later on at the Grangerfords. Who's there? It's me. Who's me? George Jackson, sir. And as you know, Huck continues to assume other identities, fabricating elaborate phony family histories to go with them. Now take Tom. In a way, Tom is a succession of masks. He lives in a series of fantasy worlds. First, he masquerades as head of the robber gang. Now, what's the line of business of this gang? Nothing. Just robbery and murder. We stop stages and carriages in the middle of the road with masks on and kill the people and take their watches and money. Must we always kill the people? Oh, certainly. It's best. Some authorities think different, but mostly it's considered best to kill them. Except some that we bring here to the cave and keep them here until they're ransomed. Is Tom deceiving himself? 
half deceiving himself? Does Ben believe him? Ransom? What's that? I don't know, but that's what they do. But how can we do it if we don't know what it is? Why blame it all? We've got to do it. How much is reality here? How much play acting? How much something in between? In the last fifth of the book, Tom single-handedly creates a complete fiction, the farcical freeing of Jim. Here, Tom is both himself and an actor in a play. Huck knows the whole business is pretense, but can't help joining in it half seriously. Jim alternates between what he knows is the real situation and his confused feeling that Tom, being his superior, must somehow have access to some superior reality. The Chinese puzzle of masks is further complicated by the fact that Huck is acting as if he were Tom. Tom is acting as if he were his brother Sid. And most confusing of all, the whole elaborate escape is unnecessary anyway, because Tom knows that Jim is really a free man. Nor is the case of Jim himself any simpler. For just as Tom must act as if he didn't know that Jim was free, so Jim must act as if he didn't know that Huck's father was dead. Even the supporting characters play many roles. Well, gentlemen, I will reveal it to you. I feel I may have confidence in you. By rights, I am a duke. My friend, your eyes this very moment is a looking on the poor disappeared dolphin. Louis the 17th. Son of Louis the Sixteen and Mary Annette. Later on, the king becomes a reformed pirate. Then the two pretenders professionalize their pretense by becoming Shakespearean actors. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Well, King, you've done that pretty well. Only you mustn't bellow out Romeo that way like a bull. You must say it soft, sick, languishing. So, Romeo. That's the idea. For Juliet's a, a dear, sweet, mere child of a girl, you know. And she don't bray like a jackass. The alternation and merging of the real and the unreal is, of course, part of Mark Twain's humor. False faces are funny. But it has, as we suggested earlier, another purpose to bind the story together with switches on a recurrent motif of appearance and reality. Now let's consider another kind of unifying element. A symbol, such as a flag, can help to unify a country. And so a symbol can help to unify a novel. In Huckleberry Finn, two major symbols pervade the book, the river and the shore. Huck's judgment on the townsfolk of Bricksville suggests what the shore means to him. A mighty ornery lot. And again? I was powerful glad to get away from those feuds. Huck passes final judgment on the shore as he watches the king and the duke being ridden out of town on a rail. Human beings can be awful cruel to one another. Contrasted with the shore is the river, with which we associate the raft. I never felt easy till the raft was two miles below there and out in the middle of the Mississippi. Then we judged that we was free and safe once more. Jim? Eh? Mm? You reckon the stars were made, or they just happened? No, I reckon they was made, huh? No, Jim. 
I judge they happened. It would have took too long to make so many. The moon could have laid them. Well, I seen a frog lay most as many. There ain't no home like a raft after all. Other places do seem so cramped up and smothery, but a raft don't. You feel mighty free and easy and comfortable on a raft. For Huck, the river seems to stand for two things. The first is freedom, mere laziness and comfortableness. The second is something much deeper. We might call it the awe, almost religious awe, which a vast natural phenomenon can call out in us. The river is more than a mere setting. It's a kind of outsized character, almost a god. As the critic Lionel Trilling puts it, after every sally into the social life of the shore, Huck returns to the god's beauty, mystery, and strength, and to his noble grandeur, in contrast with the pettiness of man. It's lovely to live on a raft. So far, we've noted two elements that give Huckleberry Finn a form. The first is the use of recurrent motifs. The second is the use of symbols. But a third unifying factor in the book is perhaps the most powerful of all, a central point of view. You don't know about me without you read a book by the name of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. But that ain't no matter. The way that book winds up is this. Tom and me found the gold that the robbers hid in the cave, and it made us rich. We got $6,000 apiece, all gold. With the opening words of the book, we are at once inside Huck's mind. And there we stay through all the masks and disguises Huck puts on. Now, what are the advantages in having everything seen from a central point of view, Huck's? Which is the more dramatic story, Huck Finn or The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, where the point of view is the author's? Tom appeared on the sidewalk with a bucket of whitewash and a long handled brush. He surveyed the fence and all gladness left him, and a deep melancholy settled down upon his spirit. Sighing, he dipped his brush and passed it along the topmost plank. Repeated the operation. Did it again. Compared the insignificant whitewashed streak with the far-reaching continent of unwhitewashed fence and sat down discouraged. In Tom Sawyer, there's a certain distance between the actual incidents and the voice that is narrating them. The tone is detached, and therefore so are we. He jumped up on his feet, looking wild, and he see me and went for me. Chased me round and round the place, calling me the angel of death and saying he would kill me, and I wouldn't come from no more. I begged and told him I was only Huck, but he roared and cussed and kept on chasing me up. Once when I turned short and dodged under his arm, he made a grab and got me by the jacket between my shoulders, and I thought I was gone. But I slid out of the jacket quick as lightning and saved myself. In Huck Finn, there's no gap between what happens and the person, Huck himself, to whom it happens. Hence the novel is dramatic, somewhat like a play. And that's the first advantage of using Huck's point of view. But there's another. Does Huck's view of life duplicate Mark Twain's? Obviously not. One's an ignorant boy, the other an experienced man. Does Huck's view of life duplicate yours or mine? Let's see. You remember that at the Grangerfords, Huck comes upon a scrapbook containing poetry written by Emmeline Grangerford, who had died at 14. Oh, no, then list with tearful eye, whilst I his fate do tell. His soul did from this cold world fly by falling down a well. 
They got him out and emptied him. Alas, it was too late. His spirit was gone for to sport aloft in the realms of the good and great. If Emmeline Grangerford can make poetry like that before she is 14, there ain't no telling what she could have done by and by. Huck serious. He doesn't know the poetry is trash. He's trying hard to understand something outside his experience. This is a trivial instance of a technique used throughout the book. Just because Huck does not understand everything he sees, we, more sophisticated than Huck, understand everything better. We interpret for Huck as we go along, and so become more deeply and personally involved in the story. But the greatest advantage of the central point of view is simply that it gives the story unity. We are always, with a few exceptions, either inside Huck's mind or just above it, judging it and enjoying it. A central point of view, recurrent motifs, and the use of symbols. These unifying elements help to give the book a structure. Yet it could have a structure and still be lifeless if the words that made up the structure were the wrong ones. The basic building blocks of a novel are not motifs or symbols or points of view. They are words put together by the writer in a certain order to produce certain effects in the reader. Centuries of summer suns had warmed the tops of the same noble oaks and pines sending their heats even to the tenacious roots, when voices were heard calling to each other in the depths of the forest, of which the leafy surface lay bathed in the brilliant light of a cloudless day in June, while the trunks of the trees rose in gloomy grandeur in the shades beneath. Those words are from the first chapter of a novel called The Deerslayer by James Fenimore Cooper. It appeared in 1841. Now listen to these words that appeared 44 years later. The stars were shining and the leaves rustling the woods ever so mournful. And I heard now, away off, hoot hooting about somebody that was going to die. And the wind was trying to whisper something to me and I couldn't make out what it was. And so it made the cold shivers run over me. Then away out in the woods, I heard that kind of sound that a ghost makes when it wants to tell about something that's on its mind and can't make itself understood so can't rest easy in its grave and has to go about that way every night, grieving. Feel the difference? Now, in many ways, Cooper is quite a good novelist, but I suspect his words bored you. I know they bored me. Yet that was the kind of English that American writers, for the most part, considered proper during most of the 19th century. Use any adjective you want. Pedantic, genteel, artificial. The point is, the words didn't really correspond to the actual language used by Americans. Do the Mugwas dare to leave the print of their moccasins in these woods? What you doing with this gun? I have been on her trail, and I know that they number as many as the fingers on my two hands. But they lie hid like cowards. Somebody tried to get in, so I was laying for them. The thieves are out lying for scalps and plunder. That bushy Frenchman Montcalm will send his spies into our very camp that he will know what road we travel. Why didn't you rouse me out? Enough. They will be driven like deer from their bushes. Okay, let us eat tonight and show the Makwa we are men tomorrow. Well, I tried it, but I couldn't. I couldn't budge you. Cooper and Mark Twain are using the same English tongue, but how differently? Cooper's writing out of an ink pot in a library. Mark Twain is reproducing the actual rhythms of speech as he's heard it. Jack turned quick and walked out. Walcott came toward him and they touched gloves. And as soon as Walcott dropped his hands, Jack jumped his left into his face twice. Oh, there wasn't anybody could box better than Jack. Walcott was after him. He was moving forward all the time with his chin on his chest. But whenever he'd get in close there, Jack would have that left hand in his face. It was just as though it was automatic. Jack just raised up his left hand and it was in Walcott's face. That's from a short story by Ernest Hemingway called Fifty Grand. Can you feel now what Hemingway meant when he said that all American literature comes from Huckleberry Finn? 
He meant that whenever an American writes close to the actual tones of our common American speech, he's following a path blazed by Mark Twain. We've seen that Huckleberry Finn is a book about freedom. Jim's vision of liberation from slavery, Huck's vision of liberation from convention. But the words themselves are liberating words, freeing us from artificial language, which often means artificial thoughts. Huckleberry Finn was a declaration of literary independence, and by right, we should celebrate its birthday with fireworks. You do a girl, tolerable poor, but you might fool men, maybe. Bless your child, when you set out to thread a needle, don't hold the thread still and fetch the needle up to it. Hold the needle still and poke at it with the thread. That's the way a woman most always does, but a man always does t'other way. <laughs> your father don't know yet what he's going to do. Sometimes he expect you're going to go, sometimes he expect you're going to stay. The thing is to just rest easy and let that old man have his own way. There's two angels hoofing over him. One white and shiny, the other black. The white and shiny one get him to go right for a little while. Then the black one just sail in and bust it all up. But you're going to be all right, huh? Of course, there's going to be considerable trouble in your life and considerable joy. Sometimes you're going to get hurt. Other times you're going to get well again. Huh? You want to stay away from the water as much as you can. Don't take no risk. Cause it's down in the bills that you're going to get home. Well, Sister Phelps, I ransacked that air cabin over, and I believe the nigger's crazy. I says to Sister Damrell, didn't I, Sister Damrell? He's crazy, says I. Them's the very words I says. You all hearing me? He's crazy, says I. Well, everything shows it, says I. Now, look at that air grindstone. Want me to believe that any critter in his right mind is going to scrabble all them crazy things onto a grindstone? Here, such and such a person busted his heart. Here, so-and-so pegged along for 37 years, and all that natural son of Louis somebody or such everlasting rubbish? He's plumb crazy, says I. It's what it says in the first place, it's what it says in the middle, it's what it says last and all the time. The nigger's crazy. Crazier Nebuchadnezzar, says I. Each of these people, by the way he talks, reveals his character. Mark Twain gave the vernacular literary respectability, made an honest woman out of her. He showed how it could be manipulated to depict character, and in doing that, he did something even more important. The real secret of Huck's charm is the same as the secret of Falstaff's charm, or Mr. Micawber's and David Copperfield. They're poets, all three of them. Poetry is the most economical form of language. It has a low coefficient of friction, does more work with less effort than any other form of writing. Huck is a poet. And when we've said that, I think we've reached the inmost heart of the book, the secret mystery of its lasting appeal. Let's listen now, not to an ignorant, unschooled boy, though he is that, but to a master of our English, or rather American, tongue. For that he is too. When I woke up, I didn't know where I was for a minute. I sat up and looked around, a little scared. Then I remembered. The river looked miles and miles across. The moon was so bright I could have counted the drift logs that went a-slipping along, black and still, hundreds of yards out from shore. Everything was dead quiet, and it looked late and smelt late. You know what I mean. I don't know the words to put it in. The whole point here, of course, is that Huck does know the words to put it in. <laughs> 